so we are live now good evening everyone i am tisha majumdar and i welcome you all to this session on forced migration curated under gys review march 2022 in association with global south colloquium university of victoria gys review march 2022 under the current theme of migration displacement and resettlement seeks to explore and understand the niceties of migration from the perspective of forced migration we are calling for submissions of stories poems and essays and for project architecture and submission guidelines please visit www.tenmustory.is today's topic of discussion is lgbtq plus communities and trafficking tracking victim vulnerabilities and discrimination we are honored to have ms rachna mujawaina as a speaker today welcome ma'am thank you so much for joining thank you i shall now quickly introduce our speaker ms rachna mujawaina she day is a transgender rights activist she is the chair of hashtag #seetal save indian trans all indian lives currently leading covid-19 relief efforts across india she is the director of human rights law network she oversees the administration of india's first unaids funded transgender clinic ms rachna is the foundation founder of the youtube channel transvision she is also the co-founder of several organizations including natka national transgender network telangana hijra intersex transgender samiti Telangana Queer Swabhimana Yatra, Telangana Women and Transgender Joint Action Committee. She is also a board member of HRLN, Bhumika Women's Initiative, and Aman Vedika Home for Children. I would now like to ask Ms. Rachna to present her views on today's topic. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you. So, will this go as a question and answer sort of like how do I? So first you are going to present your views on the topic and after that i'm going to ask you a few questions and then we can we can have the question answer segment okay got it so as you all uh, know that uh, how transgender community of uh, our country mostly has been uh, not identified with their uh, basic rights human rights or the constitutional rights and this has been well uh, dealt uh, in 2014 by the supreme court of india in the nalsa versus union of india judgment so the two judges a bench uh, justice radha krishnan and justice sikri has well uh, articulated that the constitutional rights for the transgender peoples of this country has not been um, has been uh, uh, and they have been pushed uh, uh, the fringes of the society from violating the constitutional rights so from then 2014 when this uh, historical judgment was in place we as a transgender collectives and networks we have pushed the, for the implementation of this uh, so called historical judgment uh, uh, by the state and as the uh, respected court has given parole instructions for the welfare and you know well being of transgender people of this country and in 2016 the transgender persons protection of rights bill came and <coughs> sorry and we have we have built a movement around this bill uh, regarding the lacuna in this bill and uh, and this bill till it becomes 2019 uh, act uh, the transgender persons protection of protection of rights act we were able to negotiate with the state uh, 20 such changes which uh, are need to be brought into this bill and state has agreed for that and after the 2020 the transgender persons protection of rights rules rolled over we again we have done four such con- consultancies online consultancies uh, pan india Uh, during the covid uh, period itself and uh, have given suggestions to the government of india which have lot of been have been uh, uh, come into the rules itself so our struggle has been ever not been a political struggle political struggle around the gender uh, to equate uh, the uh, transgender rights with that of the other gender uh, rights in the society uh and marginalized uh and have been vulnerable to various socio economic conditions now coming to the migration issue uh it has never been uh, articulated that a transgender community has been part of this migrations actually uh 
and i will uh, i would like to refer such few examples in front of you all uh, where the migration uh, has takes place how the migration takes place within the transgender community and how it has been ignored during the framing of various laws or policies in the first in place uh, because uh, we have the section 377 uh, as you all know we have fought a long battle uh, to decriminalize the section 377 and that's how a beautiful judgment in 2018 uh, came out uh, the navtej johar versus union of india in which judgment the government has uh, sorry the supreme court has laid down the importance of various issues of lgbt queer people of this country and one such issues is coming out so the coming out is very important to the uh, lgbt queer people that's a important process uh, just to make their identity acknowledged by themselves not only but also by their uh, parents by their siblings and also by their neighbors and when come out the teachers and the schools paternity non teaching stuff everyone this is important this is important because that the basic step to uh, to uh, which for the self acceptance and also the societal acceptance and that's how the education can be uh, ensured and also after that further employment and with that uh, with that understanding transgender community has been never understood with their, by the native families themselves and that's how they ended up running out of the homes and ended on the streets either you look as they are doing begging or sex work why i'm saying this is why they are doing or they are forced to do where we are forced to do uh, these two occupations only and we don't have such environment to express our gender so to coming out as a trans person neither in our family or nor in such geographical locations where we uh, we choose to be live either on begging or sex work so we migrate to other place uh, other uh, largely societies or the cosmopolitan spaces where we can uh, we can express our gender so this is the first step of the migration which everyone need to understand in terms of you know trans in the community actually and this has never been acknowledged this has never been discussed in any framing of the uh, policies for trans people or lgbt people so that's the basic thing after coming out and uh, if if they have been uh, migrated to other place for their livelihood and what what is now the situation uh, do they uh, belong to the place where they are uh, they have their natural families or where they are born and brought up or do they belong to the place where they have been chosen for the livelihood which they have migrated often trans in the people many of the trans in the people dabble with these two places actually and that creates another problem the place of residence and the identity and the identity as a trans and making the social entitlements avoiding the ancient social entitlements becomes a challenge for trans and the people one challenge is that the avoid as a uh, trans and the person as an identity uh, changing the name and gender uh, uh, within the uh, uh, framework of which we have now uh, because there is no previously any policy or any law in place and after that like how to change that to a travel trans identity and after changing that how to negotiate for other you know welfare uh, schemes like ration cards or bank accounts or any such housing schemes or anything so migration comes migration happens for the sake of uh, migration happens for the sake of you know expression of gender as a part of and and after this migration there is always a dilemma of of which place to be stick with so that their entitlements can be ensured so that they can avoid the state you know uh, uh welfare schemes or anything now the third thing comes if any pandemic sort of things comes over uh how it troubled a lot the trans in the community as you all know that in 2011 uh, we have a census of trans in the people only uh, a number of 5 lakhs which is available online to everyone to vote but that's a very uh, lesser number which are common typical think of like it can be five times more uh, than that number but uh, but because there is, there is no number there is no data with the government now 
during the COVID, we faced a larger problem how to how to uh, supply the essentials, food essentials or the medical essentials to the transgender community because we have no data. You know? so, so that becomes uh, a very problematic thing that, uh, that if you don't have data, you cannot serve the community and that community is left over. And who have taken care of that community during this pandemic? We only taken care of our community. And we have run pillar to post to get this support and gather the whoever is in needy actually. So the data becomes another important role and the data and further migration community because uh, in terms of transgender community because there are also other migrated communities in our country who have been served during the COVID actually. You know, there are uh, migrant labor from Bihar, UP coming to the Telangana or or the vice versa, or, or, or so they have been. They have been a special government orders also issued in the in name of such migrant communities and have been given amenities, provided amenities by the state. So in such special situations, if you don't have data, that will be a challenging task for any state to to um, to serve for the uh, for the communities like from the country. Coming to the uh, fourth uh, main issue, uh, how the migration and reference to the, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, reference to the human trafficking, I want to discuss more little. As you all know, that uh, when it, so there is, uh, if you say the trafficking, uh, you know, uh, uh, trafficking wave or trafficking moment, which has been uh, in this country, uh, they, uh, they, it has been started with the Act, ITPA Act, and uh, the rehabilitation has been, and, and the sex worker, the person who are into, into sex work, mostly the women who are into sex work, have been, uh, have been always treated as a victim and all, has been, victim has been protected uh, and has been rehabilitated. And, uh, and, and, and the, there are uh, very good laws for the trafficking and, or the traffickers to be get punished. But what we have seen uh, during is like uh, the anti-trafficking uh, mission has been a lot of uh, uh, you know rehabilitation have done to the those women who are voluntarily into the have chosen uh, sex work as a profession. We all know that, and this little bit dabbling happened because uh, they are into such places where uh, the sex work has been uh, uh, regularly carried over actually. And during the uh, during the years and years, the rehabilitation of the women who are also into the voluntary into the sex work has really sanitized those spaces. And during the pandemic, we have clearly observed that uh, we have seen uh, the Yale studies and other such studies saying that the red work red light areas has to be first stopped so that to stop the uh, you know uh, transmission of you know pandemic. But, uh, but really, like on, on what basis they have done these studies, we don't know. But uh, we do really know that sex work doesn't only uh, confirms, uh, confines only to those selected areas. It can happen any any place or sort of. But even public has been uh, aware of uh, uh, during the pandemic also whether to access or not to access such spaces also. But why these studies come in all together in between saying that um, such uh, such places are more dangerous and should be and should be locked down or sort of thing. So some way, somehow, because the sex has been the taboo, and the sex work is not a work, is not a cannot be treated as a profession, and that's how it has been marginalized. And 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 every rehabilitation of single uh, women, men, or the trans person of this rehabilitation will solve, will take care of trafficking is the is the slogan which has been uh, has sung all the time actually and do this actually uh, 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 confines or do we actually reflects the uh, real picture of like how we want to be get done in the human trafficking i think it's not because the human human trafficking the whole act or the whole objective of this uh, or the vision of this act is to restrict or to punish those traffickers actually. And where were the traffickers all these days? They have been never caught and they were never been punished. 
actually it's only we see that women who have voluntarily chosen this sex work as a work and they have been rehabilitated and but even then economic status for the welfare has not been uh, taken into any um, any countdown and also and also that's how uh, this has been so this has been the practice altogether and now come to the uh, slow shift of even uh, after the nalsa and the p77 judgment now comes the trafficking act which also take the transgender persons into its ambit you know the new act saying that there is sort of a bonded labor uh, sort of thing within the trans community and which should be eradicated awfully primarily this has been also has been gone into the transgender persons protection of rights act also criminalizing the begging saying this has been a custom and the culture which should be abolished and so on but there are a lot of more variant you know uh, technical aspects issues within this uh, within this um, hijra community or the community which have uh, or the transgender community which is dependent mostly on begging then we suggest to the government not to criminalize begging because without giving any any reservations in education or employment as the supreme court has said you cannot criminalize this then they have taken it away but the, eventually the trafficking act has taken it to it to, uh, into it folds the begging criminalizing the begging now who will do the begging the transgender community is also part of the begging and if it is going to show it as a bonded labor which has been a culture of this land for years and years and that's how the trans women trans women mostly who are out of their homes has been protected in 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 the shadow of this culture uh, now if all of the sudden uh, this uh, this whole uh, community will be criminalized actually we don't say that there is no uh, exploitation there is no violence there is no crime happens within the trans community it happens in every community in respect of any gender spectrum but that doesn't should uh, 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 the that should uh, reflect to be saying that uh, criminalizing the begging will will minimize the exploitation or minimize the Mm, the bonded labor uh, sort of exploitation within the hijra community or the trans community i don't feel the only thing which will minimize that is the welfare or the other livelihood options and the education these are the progress you were or the welfare measures the state should ensure so that the whole sort of begging or the uh, or the choice for to do a sex work as and take up a sex work as a profession can be minimized not only by uh, the men but also the uh, trans or you know uh, trans of the community so these are my views i think i'm i, am, I think i finished one or i think uh, i would like to go to the questions from yeah. thank you so much ma'am it was uh, very insightful to hear you uh, so now we'll move on to the question answer session so my first question to you is through today's discussion we seek to look into how the lgbtq plus community is more vulnerable so does that make them more susceptible to exploitation sorry repeat your question again sorry okay. through today's discussion we seek to look into how the lgbtq plus community is more vulnerable so does that make them more susceptible to exploitation so um lgbt community are more vulnerable on various terms actually because mere the uh, mere the coming out as a community person itself make them more vulnerable more uh, more prone to the prone to the you know uh, violence on them actually from the family to the other actors other stakeholders of the society so coming out itself is a more violent uh, and if it is any depends upon if it is and people who have the class privilege they can uh, somehow minimize such violence and it's not all all the ways because i have also lgbtq friends who are belong to the you know it, it also depends again on the caste who are belong to the privileged caste who are often have been uh, brutally treated or violently treated by the families by the natal families when they come out as lgbtq people so anything can happen so mere identity itself is more violent and make them vulnerable apart from the every each and every single space starting from the school and the universities colleges and also the place uh, working places 
and also the public spaces are much much vulnerable uh, to the LGBT couples if they are more visible actually and with their identity yeah thank you so much so my second question to you is that with the draft bill of 2018 as well as 2021 there has been a lot of debate and discussion about the point that the anti-trafficking law doesn't distinguish between human trafficking and consensual sex work. Instead, it criminalizes both. Could you explain what impact or consequence can this have if the necessary distinction is not made? So I have, uh, so I have a lot of uh, I means like um, political views in background of a uh, lot of legal battles and also movement backgrounds with this whole concept because as you all know that uh, uh, in 2018 there was a decriminalization of adultery in the same year we got the 377 decriminalization also so this is the outcome of the larger movement spaces you know larger movement behind this people's movement behind these decriminalizations actually this is all to bring the equality within the gender spectrum so even if you see the NASA judgment in 2014, the, uh, it has been treated as a third gender judgment. Then who are the first and second gender, you know, genders actually? So what I mean to say is that when the court is again and again trying to say that there is no such hierarchies within the genders and gender identity is the constitutional, you know, right for the each and every citizen of this country. So even every single space of freedom, what we do with our bodies should also be the constitutional right within inferred, you know, uh, within these uh, uh, articulations which have been come out of the adultery judgment, 377 judgment, and also NALSA and privacy judgment. Okay, in the background of this, what I mean to say is that we fought a longer battles to bring this, you know, freedom. Now, when coming to certain communities, who has been marginalized because they have chosen voluntarily. I again say that, saying that there is a lot of difference between the women or the trans or the children force a traffic and with that of the women or the transgender people who have chosen it as a you know, sex work as a profession. This is, there is always a confusion and conflation between both of them, okay? So if you have doing this, like if you are largely also marginalizing or criminalizing, the women or trans women who are choosing this adults and who are adults who are choosing this as a profession then what is the use of all these battles all these movements we fought all these days saying that we want the gender equality we want this liberty equality and all those things okay now? and also the constitutional validity around the you know uh, right to freedom right to movement right to profession no means again you are at the end of the day you're going to say that it differs from man to women and women to transgender and all the lgbt people it doesn't go that way actually so what i mean to say is that if we have struggled a lot in decriminalizing all these things then we need to think on the lines of equality how we perceive how we perceive and how we able to uh, believe or respect the privacy of the fellow being that whatever irrespective of the profession they choose, I give the same, you know, uh, uh, privilege or respect or other pride, whatever they have to along, uh, which is equal to me. That's one thing. Second thing is like during all these years, like the punishers actually, the other traffickers, you know, during this trafficking, whole trafficking uh, uh, um, uh, uh, field, which is that like, where are the punishments? Like, how many we have punished actually in this in this whole process actually it's only the marginalized women who have chosen to feed their families the children their you know their husbands and whatever that for their education we have chosen them and we have put them into the rehabilitation and if we do this again to go and every single so we don't know actually and that who are the women or the trans women are into the into a full time or a part time sex work sex work into sex work or choosing a sex work as a profession and now if they go on into this profession who will take the responsibility of their security and if anyone go to somewhere to attend the clan they can be happen any violence with them any 
any such crime with him and that cannot be and that goes un, un, unreported actually and no way i think that will help the women to to equate with to be uh, claiming the spaces whatever they do with their bodies one thing second thing is to report actually what the violence happens with them and a lot of crime and violence will go unreported actually even they are uh, not sex workers actually that's what and yeah why can't we see that like a woman has been taken away and has been kidnapped or she has been forced to do sex and later they portray that she's a sex worker they can do that also right? so there are ample of chances and so what i mean to say is that at least we respect the individual gender choice who are adults who are not forced who are not traffic actually to to respect their choice of work and let them have their own pride of their bodies and also their own pride of their profession that's what i mean to say thank you so no, it means that this there is a stereotypical view right like regarding the fact that they are forced uh, which kind of affects them a lot i guess because it's not always forcing it's maybe it's, it's not always forced yes always there is also a voluntary thing and that's what the 377 judgment is also saying that and and it's only half part has been decriminalized saying that the two adults with their consent among the four balls whatever they do it's state has no business in that you know? and that's a constitutional right yeah exactly okay, okay. so my uh, next question is that in the light of anti trafficking bill 2018 uh, the national network of sex workers had tweeted the bill provides no provision if victims do not want to go to the rehabilitation or accept repatriation there is a need to accept the choices we make as adults we don't need saviors so would you like to throw some light on this yes of course because the whole the whole anti trafficking rehabilitation program has been in those setups only actually it's ha it has taken away the right of uh, you know even at least communication actually you know once i have been uh, caught as a as a victim or as a person who are into as a women into sex work then soon i have been presented in front of a judge and from there i have to go to the rehabilitation center even my mobile access has been not given to my family actually and this sort of rehabilitation from and how they virtue this whole process of rehabilitation not giving any fundamental right to the victim is again uh, an illegal i i feel so actually because uh, the victim even if if even in in the jail if, if they are like perpetrator even in the jail are getting the rights to even at least to meet uh, to have a you know uh, have a meet uh, at least once in a week with their you know family people or friends or you know pals why not the women are given a scope to access to communicate at least to their families that i am so in, in a particular vulnerable situation actually actually you know that's that is which is very much alarming situation and which i need like uh, uh, i think should be raised on a larger basis second thing is like uh, so uh, in the name of like you know trauma or in the name of uh, or of counseling or in the name of rehabilitation that has to come as a choice it said should not come as a force you know if i have to get rehabilitated i have to say that i have to get rehabilitated it's not that you as a victim of trafficking or as a victim of beggar or as a victim of something you rehabilitated me actually so they the individual choice and independence is is not negotiable actually it comes as a virtue of the constitutional right for every citizen of this country you know so that's the second thing which i which which disturbs a lot saying that rehabilitation should be come out of the choice if i have to choose another livelihood i will do it if you force me make me to try in anything i may not do that if i have come out of the rehabilitation i may again go to the same sex work or something else you know which i like actually so rehabilitation should come as a choice rehabilitation should come voluntarily rather than putting a uh, rehabilitation under a forced atmosphere forcing on them will 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 never you know save the issue and 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 mostly i said that the traffickers who are there they should be punished yes 
So ma'am, uh, like uh, you were talking about the fact that rehabilitation should be a choice. So do you think that uh, you know family plays a big role in forcing rehabilitation? On yeah. No, no. Family, family plays a big, bigger important role in my life. If if I'm an adult, I'm a woman or a trans woman. Uh, I should be given choice if I want to go for leave the sex work as a profession and want to train as making a jute bag, then I should be given choice for that rather than. If I feel that I have been repeatedly uh, trafficked and have been forced to do sex work, then I should approach, I should have accessibility at rehabilitation center saying that, please rehabilitate me. I want to stay some time in your rehabilitation home. I want to stay here. Please let me stay here. That should be the way rather than filling or, or, or increasing the numbers of rehabilitation just to show you that we have rehabilitated that doesn't work actually. That, yeah. And this, this shows the power privilege or the caste privilege that few people who have power and privilege, uh, they rehabilitate who are powerless in this whole process. So my next question is that, can you enlighten us with some of the network chains of trafficking within India or trafficking from India to other countries? Uh, also, I have no idea of within the networking or out of India or within India. Uh, trafficking uh, itself is a very big, uh, larger, you know, uh, flash trade itself is a larger network and many of the, you know, Big, big people have been involved and we have seen in many multiple of cases that such people have been you know uncovered actually and those actions have been taken or not taken that that we all know actually we as media stories we came to know regularly but in this whole process is that which is unidentified network is the strongest self-identified sex worker network actually their identity has been never been acknowledged their rights have never been equally acknowledged and they never have been equally advocated. Their needs never been equally advocated, actually. And I, I know two such networks, as you also know, NNSW and ANSW. Yeah. Well, my next question is that uh, I came across an article where it was written, transgender activists as well as uh, several others have been arguing that the anti-trafficking bill was drafted without their consultation of the major stakeholders sex workers and trans persons. One of the major issues they have with the law is that it criminalizes organized begging, as you were saying a while back, which is a major source of livelihood for many in the trans community. Would you like to say something more about this? So my concern was only thing like, um, uh, so in 2018 trafficking bill, the it, it, like they tried to portray, they also included the begging as, uh, you know, one of the, you know, uh, one of the means of trafficking, actually. So, uh, so the transgender community is mostly dependent on begging. You know, you can name it in any terms of badai or basti or something, anything. And that is the profession uh, which comes not as a choice for us. It's from the it's from the transphobia or the exclusion which the society made to us, and out of no choice we have cultivated begging as our choice as a as a means of livelihood just to remain live alive keep alive we have chosen begging and won't you feel that minimum responsibility while criminalizing this profession you need to call the transgender people such a bigger and larger community just to consult with while you criminalize in this community so that's that's the first basic you know challenge or the question i have and because if you might have called this for consultation, we might have told that you cannot criminalize begging actually. And if you have criminalized also, then we have a choice to uh, provide a exclusion from crim getting criminalized from this because this has been our livelihood and no, nothing else has been our livelihood actually. If you do sex work, that also uh, as a livelihood, that's one thing. Second thing is like, uh, apart from begging and the sex work also, uh, I said previously as the, the independent freedom of choosing of, you know, uh, you are being, a, being an adult, choosing of your uh, sexual partner. It can be male, either female or in a trans person. That so-called independence may infringe due to, you know, to do this so-called trafficking, uh, you know, because people, see, normally people uh, who live together, LGBTQI couples, 
they are under the surveillance saying that what actually society doesn't accept them and so society creates a larger issues for them and try to criminalize them you know if two girls stay two boys stay what are they doing actually and they won't get houses if they have houses there are a lot of you know mischief things and horrible things happen around you know so i face them and many of the community face them and if in this environment you and we are now slowly in 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 the inducing the uh, uh, the principle of diversity within the you know indian society indian society is have accepted only hijra community for their blessings and everything but never never accepted their sexual orientation that has been always criminalized that's how we have to fought this 377 you know uh, uh battles also so um so what i mean to say is that if if this independence has been infringed and you have been criminalizing this uh, stay together independence that will um, that will hamper a lot of lives of lgbtq people also so that these are the two concerns actually yeah so basically our society is essentially heteronormative and that affects the lives of lgbtq community sorry can you come again society so, uh, i was saying that uh, so basically our society is essentially heteronormative and that uh, kind of uh, affects the lgbtq community and and, and and still this diversity and diversity of sexual orientation and having couples within the you know, lgbtq people has not been understood and have not been yeah. received still by the indian community that's yeah. what I mean. yeah. so do you think that they are changing now like with time yeah we are pushing we are pushing from our side we are pushing and yeah. a lot of lot of loss of lives are there you won't believe that and people hang over and people get suicide people die over just to make believe that our love is a true love and our exactly. bodies are also equally important to get loved and give love that's it so uh, my next question is that there is a general mistrust and fear of law enforcement agencies where the lgbtq plus community is concerned and unfortunately so but they are not seeking legal assistance or aid can this be linked to more trafficking from within these communities um, so the main so the main hurdle in this behind this is like the insensitivity within the you know uh within the state administration you know insensitivity in the sense of like the not even sensitized about for example if in in so many years after 2014 judgment we were saying that we are transgender people transgender people people are the police for example only understand trans means hijra okay and and if if anyone say gay term gay term gay is also hijra then this so this this insensitivity in the sense of this diversity has not been understood by the administration by rolling out the, but dealing by the law you know and this this uneducation often makes the community people vulnerable when they approach for any legal assistance actually okay when a gender non binary trans person approaches a police station people feel ha chakka hai gay even though the person who is in a male attire he is saying that i am a trans woman police won't get that logic into their head they feel that hijra women who are begging on the roads are doing sex work they are trans people that's so what i mean to say is that there is lot of hesitation in approaching the law you know uh, abiding institutions or law implementing agencies because this lacuna is there in terms of gender sensitivity and gender orientation or sexual orientation okay but that's one thing and and that infers again on the application of law also if for example two women are there they are couples and the women came out of her home and want to live with other women soon police feel that there is a kidnap case because the girl is missing and so and and lot of time we sensitize police no this is this is this girl is adult this girl is adult and they are voluntarily want to live together and there is no harm and now we have become less than 77 hours so this sort of insensitivity comes out of the ignorance of law and ignorance of law is not also not only ignorance of 377 on all side privacy but also application of horrible laws on the lgbtqi communities or couples 
this often discourages people to immediately approach to the legal help or the you know law uh, implementing agencies so we need to sensitize more people and we need more sensitized officers within the departments so that when such situation comes over they can apply the rational actually they they apply the rational under 377 nals uh, and privacy and all those things and we uh, i won't say that we have not changed we have changed the officers i've seen in my experience saying that uh, uh, so when two girls are living together then they call they find a case against their parents the police call the parents say that no we are not this is not your business you're not going to touch them and you will have an like you know reverse effect on this if you touch them we have seen such police officers also and we have made such police officers after the long since transition and slowly the uh, society will change i think so do you also think that education plays an important role in this uh, like in this yeah, sensitization feels uh, yeah yeah it plays a very vital role in this yeah so uh, now my last question to you is in your years of experience could you share some anecdotes or memories of working for trans rights sorry but for what trans rights uh your memories of working for trans rights could you share what i have done for trans rights yes exactly oh, that's a very like you no know, very beautiful question i can say <laughs> to you because <clears throat> so as you you might have also known, i have been a transgender sex worker for 20 years i'm i'm a trans woman i identify myself i'm a double post graduate myself and and so of that also been forced to be uh, to be on this profession as a sex worker you know and uh, and initially uh, uh, in five or six years i used to face a lot of a uh, lot of crisis in my profession not only me my co sex workers also it can be from the strangers it can be police and it can be anyone and i thought of like this should end actually and this should end the sense at least minimize this crime and violence happen to the uh, happens often to the you know uh, trans women most people are into the sex work mostly and we as a collective or in telangana we able to negotiate that space with the state saying that now nf is nf you cannot <coughs> criminalize like this and this won't solve the problem because this will make our people to go under the he hide under the racks and that's how lot of the problems going to be because there is hiv there is aids like hiv And, and there are STIs, and and there is and there is a lot of things actually going to happen if it's going to hidden under rags, and that's how we be able to sensitize the police, and we were may make able to make create such environment within uh, you know uh, society that at least they won't uh, you know be violent towards you know transgender women, not be violent actually, and also few uh, stakeholders like judges uh, or the doctors. This is after two thousand fourteen years. to be sensitive towards our transgender people who visit their you know spaces for any sort of services lawyers doctors and police stations and all these people thus 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 that moment gave me very um uh, a satisfaction saying that like we as a community am unitedly able to achieve this and the same thing has been same unity and same power we have been uh, articulated during the 2016 bill when the bill has lot of lacuna in it uh, it's 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 it become a national international movement actually around the bill and the w path writing to the indian government saying that this goes very you know illogical this bill goes and these are the changes you are supposed to do and the self identity is uh, is what the supreme court want to and that's what universally has been done and so why i'm saying is that this all comes from the same battles how uni- unitedly we as a trans women into sex work have been articulated or negotiated on the time being actually so this gives me a lot of satisfaction and now uh, at a certain point of where now now i am being expert and now i am a technical expert for the clinic i'm working now uh, and i now sits in a office space you can see <laughs> i am in an office and i work with my laptop and i have a designation and i have a salary package Uh, though i have given up the sex work after 20 years because now it's not uh, my age to do all the sex work but i often talk about sex work as a part of my life 
and also the problems faced by you know trans people who are into the sex work hiv aids and all those things and all whatever the developments around i have a youtube channel transvision sort of and we have uh, got the award and i have written uh, songs and i have sung to the rajnikanth movie darbar movie a <laughs> song and all this gives an immense pleasure though i have been not highlighted as a star at the end of the day a bigger transgender celebrity but it's it's to me like saying that it's it at the end i can say it gives a hope for those trans women who are very independent want to live independent who are educated can work out and can be successful that's it so ma'am you just pointed out uh, something uh, so i would like to ask one more question uh, so um, you just talk, spoke about aids and hiv and everything so you think that the society stereotypically associates diseases uh, with the lgbt community no it never do that because the um, so how fastly we connect with uh, the emotions like religion or caste in the same way with the with the diseases we won't uh, get connected even we have gone through a lot of pandemics uh, in this world but but it's but it's it's become our responsibility like how i have been negotiated with a lot of police officers when they catch hold the trans men and put into the lock lock rooms saying that uh, then we were able to negotiate with them like uh so this will this will hamper the at least so the marginalization from the working class background and the working class grassroots actually have been articulated in a lot of the lgbtqi rights negotiations also that's what i mean to say that and in that hiv is the one of the most powerful you know subject uh, with the law implementing agencies saying that you being a you know public servant you have been also been socially responsible uh for not making the epidemic to be larger you know so we are striving and we are working towards the zero infection rates and not to be new infections because that can be anyone out of our kith and kin you know to get to be can be get infected and if you go on marginalizing the more vulnerable communities that will not solve the problem actually that will uh blast the problem actually you know so in that way that way uh, uh, i will say case to case Uh, and and stakeholder to stakeholder we were able to do that and i have been i have been negotiable and also been sensitive but at a larger uh, larger spectrum i feel that we need more mass uh, such things and also go into the curriculum and also you know intellectual curriculums also how these uh, epidemics or or the diseases can hamper uh, the uh, social life uh, when the marginalized lives has been disturbed or you know uh, uh, have been hampered yeah thank you so much ma'am it was a remarkable session so with this we come to the end of today's session i would once again like to say that we are calling for submissions of stories poems and essays and for project architecture and submission guidelines please visit our website uh, thank you so much ma'am for joining us today it was very enlightening uh, to hear you uh, thank you so much.